One of the things that Norwegians learn about is that we have a very strong meteorology tradition. Uh, one of these meteorologists who were sort of like, uh, was like well known for starting the school was this Wilhelm Bergnes. Uh, it used to be a, like, a, like, a, <laughs> it's like a, you were honored when you put on a tail of a Norwegian airplane. Now I don't really know anymore. But uh, anyway, he is certainly very well known. And he, he said that weather prediction is a mathematical problem. And what he meant is that at around the 1900, he said that the, law, the classical laws of physics uh, were known, well, not relativity, but that didn't matter for the weather. Uh, and he said, well, if you know the, we know how atoms move, we know how, oh, we know how, well, we know how to describe the basic laws this, the, and this, describing the weather at, um, at the sort of like the small level. So it's, if you could just put everything, describe all, I mean, like make a big, uh, mathematical calculation, you should be able to predict the weather. Of course, this was not possible in practice around, uh, around uh, 1900. Uh, actually, if you read, it's actually interesting to read the history of weather prediction because it's before it became, now it, it's sort of uh, what we call a mechanistic model. Now we, as I'm coming to, you can sort of compute the weather using the laws of physics. But before that was possible, they did something more like statistical weather prediction. So they, which is very similar to statistical modeling in neuroscience actually, because they, you look at sort of, you essentially look at what is the weather now and you measure the weather now. And then you look on what was the weather in the past, the last 10 days. And you take the average of the, of the weather in the past, sort of like all the different weather patterns in the past leading up to this particular today's weather pattern. So it's a little bit like a spike triggered uh, uh, average. Anyway, that's not the main point here. Anyway, but the point is that if they couldn't do this, uh, well, this just illustrates that you have all these this, this different scales which are connected all the way from like 10 meters up to, uh, well, and I guess that's uh, 10 to the four, and 100,000, 10 to the four kilometers. That's like, uh, how much is that? That's 10,000 10, kilometers. So that's essentially the size uh, scale of the Earth that you have all these interconnected uh, interconnected scales, and so uh, and 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 it wasn't possible to pursue this program until the advent of the computer. I think the first weather forecast from mathematical models came in 1954, but now all weather forecasts are computed from such models. So this is the weather forecast for Eris Fjord, which I. Download, we'll look at a couple of days ago. I don't know how accurate it is, but at least, of course, statistically has been shown that this is by far the best, and give by far the best sort of like weather predictions uh, compared to other methods. And interestingly, it's also a steadily improved quality that it predicts one day better into the future uh, per decade, meaning that the accuracy of predicting weather five days into the future today is like the accuracy of uh, uh, predicting four days into the future 10 years ago. So we're getting steadily better. And this is because this is like this fantastic collaboration between people doing measurements, doing modeling, all kinds of numerical trick on supercomputers. And it's like this, clearly this, this international community that has developed these methods. And it's, it's fascinating because in this, this day and age where, where people often try to make a name for themselves in science, nobody has heard about uh, <laughs> uh, like a meteorologist. You don't have a meteorologist, Einstein. And certainly, uh, and so it's more the community uh, which is the, the hero. So this is just, uh, just to make a point that it's possible to solve this, to, to be able to accurately predict and to bridge all these scales like they do in, in weather forecasting by combining, by essentially doing physics type modeling on the computer combined with a lot of statistical tricks and, and, and so on. Another example where we bridge scales is the, uh, like a smartphone. So also here, I mean, you can actually make this analogy between the brain, the different levels of the, of the, of the brain, atom, molecule, molecular network, neuron, neural circuit brain, and the same, the same kind of um, 
can also make this this level well similar analogous levels at them crystal like tailored materials like this semiconductor heterostructures this is what i used to work on before i got interested in neuroscience then you have transistor and, and and chip and so on so then we can ask and and if you sort of ask no no single individual in the world can make a, a smartphone right i mean you have all these specialists at different levels and so how what what how they how were like the world was how how was the community of, of scientists and and, uh, and engineer able to make such a thing well you need a very precise language to have this this uh, uh, well precise communication between people working at different levels and that language is of course as i think many of you agree with is is mathematics right that's the only thing where the language which is so precise that you can uh, can actually do many derivations in a row and still the or uh, many operations in a row and if you could do the math correctly then you actually get the correct result or the the, the result holds even after many many such uh, many such derivations and actually, it's, if you also look at the, to make these smartphones work and, and so that you're able to say program, like I can sort of push a button and then uh, push an icon and get out the weather in it is food. Of course, that relies on programming. And there you also have, uh, let's see, there you have also different levels. I mean, I think there's four levels of programs on top of each other that sort of uh, from like down to the fall well, from the app programming down to sort of like down at the at the transistor level at the machine machine language. So so what's the status for um, uh, what's the status for uh, for neuroscience and computational neuroscience? Well, I would say uh, let's see. Largely, we have we know that we know the laws of physics or chemistry, whatever you call it. Well, the laws of nature. <laughs> for at these different levels. I mean, we have the, like, obviously the, the quantum mechanics, and then you have this chemical rate equations, and, and at the neural level, we have this cable equation, and, and so on. And, and at a higher level, you can even sort of make approximations like, uh, like firing rate models, and, and, and so on. So we sort of have the mathematical framework. What we don't know, so yeah, so the framework is ready. And, and so I would say that the, the principles of brain modeling is uh, is is well established. I would say. I mean, at least it's it's you know how to sort of model individual. Uh, you know how to model individual uh, units and and put them into to networks. And uh, so, uh, and we also know pretty well how to link how to link this or. I would say like the first two here, like modeling the, the neuro information flow has been worked on for a long time, at least since the, the uh, like Hodgkin and Huxley and so on in the early fifties. Uh, and, uh, but, but the, the, the final piece here, which I, is made this, this uh, handbook of neural activity measurement is added just to illustrate that you also need to do the measurement physics, right? Meaning, you have to, if you have like a network model for a piece of how like, how, like a piece of, uh, say a piece of cortex or whatever, uh, you need a way to link your model predictions to the things that you can actually measure. Because typically what comes out of a model is action potentials and people compute spikes. And I'm quite sure you have many lectures on how to model uh, spikes and how to analyze spikes. But that's typically not what is, uh, well, that's no, certainly not the only thing that is measured and in fact, it's other measurements that is maybe better suited for, for at least if you want to understand networks, at least as a key complement, because uh, spikes are quite noisy, uh, so it is like a, and and it's difficult to to measure uh, measure many. I mean, even with the best multi electrodes you have, it's difficult to to uh, to to measure more, say than more than a hundred. Well, at least per shank. You know, like the neuropixel probe that the Allen Institute is making, you can make typically measure from 80 or 100 neuron spikes at the same time. Uh, and then you can, of course, have many of those, but still, nevertheless, in a, in a particular column, you can only measure uh, 
uh, like 80 neurons, which is a very, very, like, it's, uh, it's severely undersampled if you want to understand what, uh, in detail, what, what this column is doing. While other measurements like the local feed potential and other electrical brain signals contain more information on that. But at least it's, uh, I want to, this is sort of the good news, I would say. We, we know how to, I mean, we, we certainly don't have like, a, a, I mean, we certainly don't, I, nobody will say that we claim that we understand how the brain works, how it computes information, but at least we know, know the, the, how we know how to model the building blocks. Uh, so if you want to compare with my, my I used to do with, I uh, worked with solid state physics before, and there we can say at the same level, say that, well, if you want to understand the, the, the electrical or optical properties of a met piece of metal or a piece of semiconductor, what you have to do or is, is sort of to, to, to put a bunch of atoms uh, with their electrons and stuff in a lattice and then compute what the electrons are doing. And uh, that's easy to say and hard to do, but at least we know sort of, uh, we have a solid starting point here. In the brain, we, we know that we, what something sort we have to do also, we have to put these neurons and, and connect them up in the network. What makes one of the things that makes neuroscience harder is that we don't really know all the parameters because there's, there's so much, much more heterogeneity in the neurons and, 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 and certainly the parameters, while in uh, like solid states, all, all electrons are the same. So in that sense, it's, it's simple. But at least we know how to sort of to do sort of like physics type modeling in principle. And if we start, I think we have one thing which is also very good that we seem to have like a quite solid starting point uh, for, we know how to model neurons quite well. We know how to, this, this key is starting with uh, the work of Hodgkin and Huxley. We know how to compute how single neurons receives input from other neurons and, and, and compute uh, and, and, and generate action potentials. We know how to model in principle, how this, these neurons with the dendritic trees and so on, uh, actually receive uh, synaptic inputs and integrate these inputs and produce new action potentials. So this is mainly, so we have now this rather solid starting point. We know how to model neurons and they have all this of course, is the, the key, the key, the, the thing that makes neurons different and makes neurons interesting, make them able to fire action potentials are these particular ion channels that are proteins. Uh, so that's sort of like, and you can model them at, in, at, the, at like a molecular dynamics level, much more, more detailed, uh, but that's not really uh, necessary. You can sort of also make this more, more sort of like, well, well the descriptive models and physical models. So anyways, I would say that we pretty know, we, if I would say, if I want to tell my, my, my uh, a relative in a Christmas party, what do we know about the brain? I would say, well, we, we know pretty well how a single neuron operates and the principles for that. But what we don't know is sort of how, how networks of such neurons operate. So yeah, I just want to show, illustrate that we can model these single neurons. So this is just an illustration that was made in our, our group. I think there's like four neurons or something that <coughs> receive synaptic inputs, not shown exactly where they are, but that's some of these dendrites. What is color coded here is, is the membrane potential. And you can see sometimes it fires these flashes. Uh, so, and that's when I fire these action potentials. But the point is that we can sort of in this, in this, um, uh, in this sort of universe, we can sort of compute everything, and we can try out different uh, whatever morphologies, ion channel distributions, and see uh, what, uh, well, what, uh, so what happens. And it's also here in this uh, animation we see see four dots here. This is just to illustrate four electrode recording points that is sort of maybe attached on this electrode, uh, <coughs> because that's something, as Ivan mentioned, that we have worked a lot on in our group, is sort of to make the link between, uh, uh, if you have neurons which are active, like these ones, and what you would measure on these electrodes. So that's the measurement physics problem. So that's, and, and of course, the spikes, 
that you pick up, for example, on these electrodes, that one example and of, of an important electrical brain signal. Okay, so, so I said, from going from the neuron to neural networks is, is, is much harder. And there are several reasons for that. Uh, uh, because it's, if you want to, if you, if you want to test your, if you want to make progress in like say understanding, um, uh, understanding sort of how uh, like networks of neurons work, you need to, to make models and then you can sort of make models, say, in, in, in like in a one cubic millimeter of cortex, if you want to understand a cortical network, it's 100,000 neurons. And uh, of course, like one cubic millimeter isn't too, isn't too much. And so, and, but even 100,000 neurons, if you want to model them at least with biophysical detailed neural models, that's difficult to do just from a practical point of view. So even if you have an idea about what, what you think an interesting model for 100,000 neurons, biophysically detailed neurons are, it's difficult to test how to, I mean, it's difficult to, to, to test out the model on a, on a computer. Uh, and, and of course, if you want to explore, if you want to do science on a model, you need to be able to explore the, the behavior of the model in different parameter regimes. And if you have a network model with 100,000 neurons, and uh, then of course there's a bunch of parameters uh, there and you know, the, the many it's the many parameter combination you want to explore so it's difficult to really just analyze analyze the model because each run of the model takes a lot of time and, and requires a lot of computer computer power so <laughs> so that's why i just say right, so, uh, so this nice quote it takes a world to understand the brain i think that's uh, that's sort of yeah, I think that was a nice quote because in order to deal with just this, this always a methodological complexity of, of trying to understand this very complex system, there's been a lot of international, uh, international uh, well, initiatives taken and are like this large, uh, I guess you, many of you have heard about the human brain project. Uh, we've been involved in that or we are involved in that where our job is like one, one, one important, uh, well, one, well, one uh, human brain, brain project involves um, many things, but uh, one thing is sort of be able to have these different network models, both like the uh, biophysically detailed models, uh, but also then models at the level of integrate, like point neurons, integrate the fire type models, and also uh, firing rate models, so at different levels of, of detail, and then be able to run them efficiently on, on computers, which are uh, centralized somewhere in Europe. So that, <coughs> for example, you can uh, and, uh, sit here in Edisfjord or whatever, or whatever you want in Norway or all over the Europe or all over the world, and actually be able to, to run a simulation uh, uh, when this is ready on these centralized supercomputers in, in, in um, well, plays different places in, in Europe. So I think this is, if you think of, sort of like the history of history of how you could do neuroscience, it used to be that in order to do neuroscience, you had to be, uh, well, if you want to do computation neuroscience in particular, then in order to get access to data, you needed typically to, uh, to, to work in a lab or be in a collaborating, be like a employed modeler in a lab or at least have a close collaborator, which uh, you, gave you some data. Uh, and then uh, when, when people started doing some data sharing, then you could sit other places like we do here. This is our group in an MBU, the lower dot here. We could sit here <coughs> and get work on data recorded uh, elsewhere. Nevertheless, we were had to do to make the models ourselves and, and run the models ourselves on our own computers. And that's difficult to do if you want to run large scale network models. But now you should be able to sit anywhere where you have a network access and be able to, to run uh, not only, well, not only get data to construct your model and to test your, like for, for testing your model from like this, uh, this large scale uh, or this, this pooled resources, you should also be able to, to sit anywhere and 
and run uh, and just log into supercomputers and run your model. So I think it's it's a way to to really mobilize a lot a lot more brains, uh, so so that we can do do neuroscience. So I, I've been thinking of I mean if you think of sort of like the outside Europe in particular, if you think of sort of like the number of eager brains in countries like. Uh, India and China and Indonesia and I mean Nigeria and like uh, there's like there's very populous countries where many people now get access to at least laptops. So now you can have all these people working maybe to 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 make sense of all the data that is now recorded in in, in maybe the, like the western part of the world and, and and well some rich parts of the world. Then yeah, that's like the Human Brain Project. Then we have the MindScope Project, which I think is very fascinating. It's the I think you all heard about the Allen Institute for Brain Science in Seattle. This uh, this uh, this guy who started the Microsoft with Bill Gates, and well, I've done many, many things with his uh, with his wealth, including starting this Allen Institute for Brain Science, where they have focused on 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 like the last ten years, really making a detailed, really detailed uh, uh, neurobiological study of the mouse visual cortex, both like electrophysiology, anatomy. And also sharing their data in a very efficient, uh, in efficient way, uh, and so that's like many people just. I mean, obviously for these transcription maps and all kinds of things. So it's a, it's a very very popular site, and they, because it's uh, funded by a private person, Paul Allen, who insisted that this data should be get out to make be made publicly available even before you be able to write papers on them yourself. It's been this very aggressive style of, of making data available. So it's sort of a little bit uh, almost ironic or paradoxical that, uh, that, the, the, that the most data which has been recorded uh, based on funding from public sources are in practice often not available uh, for, for other scientists, uh, while the only data which is really available has been funded by, uh, for everyone has been fund funded by a private person. So, um, of course, it's also now publicly recorded data, which is now also been made public. Then you also had this brain project that was initiated by Obama. So these are all large scale projects. And there are also other international initiatives from uh, Australia and China and, J and Japan, uh, uh, where we're trying to essentially the same idea that we have to pool resources and to, to deal with this, this complexity. So <laughs> we also wrote this, I think uh, this, this, this perspective article that came out in 2019 uh, and about why we need to do brain simulations. Uh, because I think there's been some, uh, uh, I think it's, uh, we, many of you know about this, this discussion about the Blue Brain Project and then and um, whatever, and, and um, human brain project, and there was all kinds of like uh, discussions and even like whatever petitions against like uh, the project and so on. It was really, uh, really strange. And, and uh, luckily it's a very unusual thing to, do, uh, to start petitions against other people's projects. But uh, there's also been a, mis a bit com confusion about what these large brain scale, brain simulations can do, because it's, it's not like, uh, it's not like these large scale brain networks is, can be expected to be that you sort of just put the model together and, and somehow that, that like a miracle, the genie comes out of the bottle and it's like behaves in a way that is in any way similar to real brains. So in order to make this point, uh, which is also as described in this paper is we sort of compared uh, with, uh, if you sort of look at, uh, well, Newton, if you go back to Newton, of course the, almost the founder of, of modern, modern physics, he, he had this idea about the movement of planets. So his physics idea was that you have this uh, gravitational force between two masses, and this could be uh, the moon and the earth, or the moon and the sun, or the moon and an apple, whatever. And, and then you have this just, he yeah, assumed that it had this attraction, which is proportional to the masses, and inversely proportional to the distance. So that was the force. And then he needed to assume something about, well, how does a, a mass uh, behave or how does it change? How does it move? 
uh, when a force is acting on it. And then he came up with F equals MA, that is actually a force means that it changes velocity, it accelerates. So, so this was, of course, turned out to be a good idea. But how did, how, how could Newton know that is, how could he test this idea? Well, then you needed mathematics. It's not so obvious what these laws by themselves tell you about the, like the orbits of planets, whether they should be circular or square or whatever, right? Uh, and and uh, so this was sort of a, so, so they, you needed math to look at the consequences. And so he had to check how to check whether his idea was right. Then he ended up actually inventing calculus because that was sort of a, so he had to invent sort of a new type of mathematics. Actually, historically, he did something with like geometry first, but uh, he invented also calculus and that's how we learn mechanics today. So, so without this calculus or like mathematic techniques, you wouldn't be able to, to check whether your theory was right or wrong. So it was only after he sort of came up, well, well, after he was able to look at the consequences, compute the consequences, that's when he sort of saw that his, his uh, equations sort of, uh, his laws predicted the right orbits of the planets and even predicted the, an unknown planet because it was some kind of, uh, well, eventually because it was something, some discrepancy between his theory predictions and some, detailed orbit this was a couple of hundred this was like 100 years later or something or 200 years but anyway so this was sort of like an extremely successful theory which also explained like the the ebb and flow kind of things with the with the oceans and so on but the point is he needed calculus to test to be able to compute all this so i say like this large scale brain simulations is not a hypothesis by itself it's a hypothesis tester and so coming back to our role in the human brain project is sort of to be is sort of to do this to compute to make the link between model predictions whether it's like neurons or networks uh, and like model activity dynamics and what you would measure with different recording devices whether you have an electro typical electrical or magnetic recordings if you have an electrode inside the brain uh, or or at the cortical surface, or at the, at the scalp, or, or even like at like EEG, or even magnetic field outside, outside the brain, outside the, the head. So, uh, so as I said, in order to falsify a theory, you we need to be able to compare model predictions with experiments. And now there's a bunch of new experimental techniques that has been developed, I would say, maybe if you look at the last 20 years, like the first uh, two, two decades of this century, or th well, the last three decades, I think the, the strongest development in neuroscience has been on, uh, 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 has been on the methods developing for measurement. I mean, obviously you have, a, and maybe in particular, while well, you have the development on electrodes that you can now measure uh, electric potentials at more and more positions with more and more electrodes. And, but also that in terms of optical techniques where you can now not only, uh, you can put in different, different kinds of uh, like molecules that, that makes them uh, make, make it possible to measure this uh, like activity, particularly with the calcium imaging, two photon calcium imaging, where you can get very high spatial resolution and also then optically activate uh, optically activate networks and so on. So, but then, and this, of course, and each of these, these techniques, of course, they, they tell something different about, uh, about what your, what the brain does or what your piece of neural tissue that you cord from does. So I'd like to show this, 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 I think, nice image. If, if you sort of were like in a foreign civilization, same civilization, and you imaged, and it came came out, and it is sort of uh, like one of these UFOs that uh, the Pentagon will not uh, uh, will not uh, admit exist. That they actually orbit the Earth, and you uh, and you can measure them. Uh, neural, well, one thing you could do, and this is actually the top one, is an imaging of electrical activity. And this is actually put together. This is like a 
just like an image put together with from satellites uh, on the like when they're taking pictures from the night side uh night side of the of the, of the well when they, they fly over on the over at night and they put it together so here you can sort of just looking at this image you could get the impression that people what where people live is really on the east coast of us and and part of europe even uh like southern norway uh and even it is fluid it seems like people live which is of course not true as you know you've been there and uh, and also india and then japan of course, if you had some kind of other measurement device, so this is sort of what we measure with uh, inverse modeling and, uh, and EEG and MEG. Uh, but instead, if you're able to measure uh, like image the hemodynamic activity, especially food consumption, we'd get a very, very different, uh, different image. Uh, so there you would see that, that people typically live in uh, India and, uh, and China and some, uh, some points in, in Europe and uh, down here also on the, on the coast of, of, of Brazil, but certainly not up in, in Norway. So the point is that none of these images gives like the full picture. You have to, they, they are complementary. So you, but together they give you more information than each of them uh, individually. So, um, so, okay. So what is then, I just, uh, we take a short break, but first we just take this, this slide. And so what, what you're sort of advocating is that, I mean, if you want to do, if you want to sort of do like, I mean, the physics type modeling, the physics approach to natural sciences is that you put your, you make a model and in terms of like a mechanistic model in terms of the building blocks of uh, uh, building blocks of the thing you're interested in. In our case, it's, it's neurons and then you hook them up. If you're sort of interested in a piece of cortex, which is an example here, it's like a piece of visual cortex where the, this, in this case, a mouse processes visual information. Then you would like, uh, you would like, uh, I think for a, where I'm like a good understanding, you would like maybe both one, a model in terms of the biophysically detailed neurons. And uh, Anton Alkipov is actually talk, going to talk about that. We are collaborating on, 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 uh, on this endeavor, and they have made this fantastic model at the Allen Institute, uh, spearheaded by, by his group. So then you can have this model at, uh, at the biophysically detailed neurons. And, but also, you would like to have, uh, have the model at the same model at the like reduced, maybe to point neurons, which are the fire type neurons, and maybe even firing rate. Uh, well, population firing rate models. So the thing is that, of course, these 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 models, if you move upwards, it gets what it, we say that it gets less and less dimension. It gets fewer and fewer dimensions in the mathematical sense. There are fewer and fewer differential equations, so they get low dimensional, at least lower dimensional. So you don't expect them to explain. I mean, you expect this this kind of model, in principle, to be able to explain much more much more data, much more observations. And uh, nevertheless, you also need these models in order to, well, uh, in order to just sort of to also to gain a better understanding of, of, uh, of what's going on. So it's, it's sort of just like, in some sense, it's like the, it's a combination of, if you look at the gas, the combination of uh, like a, a, the gas, the molecular understanding of gases and the thermodynamic understanding of gases together gives a very good understanding of gases. But the thing is, typically lots of people are, have been working on making models here, but they typically have been comparing with spikes. So that's typically what the model has been producing. But there are all these other measurement modalities, particularly like uh, these are electrical. I'm going to talk about that after the break, LSP, ECO, EEG, MEG, and also optical measurements like voltage sensitive dye imaging and so on. So what you would like to do is you sort of formulate your, formulate your hypothesis in terms of mathematically specified models. And then you sort of make predictions uh, about the, these measurement modalities that, or the things that you have measured. And then you go back and forth and try to make contact or make the model essentially predict, predict that you measure. That's sort of like the standard physics, physics approach. So the reason I'm interested in electrical signals, electrical brain signals, other than spikes, because, uh, well, I'm interested in that too, but that's, you can actually measure spikes. And even though you cannot 
yeah, you can sort of <laughs> a spike, even though we don't really maybe not understand exactly why the spike looks exactly what it does. You know that it actually, if you have a single spike, you know that it corresponds to an action potential uh, in in the in the neighboring in a in a neuron which is close by. So, but the reason I'm interested in doing this electrical brain signals, well, this is one of the main reasons that there, is that you will be better able to 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 falsify your models. Uh, Multi-purpose will mean that you want to have models that are able to predict many things at the same time. Often in the models that there, we sort of look at network models that are uh, uh, well, well, well uh, maybe account for irritation, selectivity, or certain features that is observed in the firing of neurons. So <laughs> in some sense, we want to sort of try to go beyond that and make sort of more, say like large scale network models that are able to predict many things at the same, at the same time. So for those of you who are interested in that, can just, uh, just look into that. And of course, it's a, it's a free online workshop. You only need to register. So, uh, but now I want to sort of to, to uh, if you sort of look at, if you sort of want to tell, I mean, if you sort of want to, to, to uh, well, if you want to tell what have you really found out about how, how, how networks work, right? I mean, we know quite a bit about single neurons. We can make models of, of how single neurons integrate information and make actual potentials. But what about what is going on in, uh, in, in, well, in real brains? And I think the, the main take-home message so far, the things that we really learn is about neural representations. So if you sort of measure then, if you sort of focus on then like a piece of, piece of cortex, you have all these uh, this, this neurons. And then if you put a sharp electrode close to the somas of these neurons, then you can, <coughs> then you can measure spikes from that particular neuron. And then you can investigate, okay, what, what kind of feature, what feature does, or what, what does, when, uh, under what circumstances is this neuron firing action potentials? And that's often called um, an receptive field of a neuron. And I think the most famous, and the one maybe like the, the, that was started this, at least in, in mammals, was the work of Jubel and Isil, uh, where they found these cells in the visual cortex, which responded only to, to bars. They didn't respond very much to like circular stimuli, which was sort of the, uh, which has been seen for cells in the retina and in this uh, LGN, which is this relay station between the retina and the cortex. But back here in the cortex, they found cells that responded only to, to bars or things which had elongated. And not only that, they found cells, they found that cells only, that each cell only responded to bars oriented in a particular direction. Like for example, in this case, the red bar uh, oriented in this direction made, made these action potentials, which are shown as spikes here, or these like bars here. Uh, while if you had the same, <coughs> if you're just rotating away from this optimal, optimal uh, orientation, we get less and less firing until they really got, got none. So that was the start of, of, of this, of like hunting for receptive fields. This was done in the late 50s. And then we started um, uh, looking for like cells coding for both like touch and movement of muscles. So you made this uh, what's called homunculus. So that was at the, like these cells at the top of the cortex. <laughs> and then we even found this famous Jennifer Aniston cell, this, this patient. <clears throat> of course, this is not something you see in, in, in mice, or maybe you do, I don't know. But at least this was a cell that was found in a patient in Los Angeles, 2005, male patient who, who then uh, was waiting to undergo some kind of brain surgery. I think it was for, for like uh, epilepsy. And they had like some electrodes implanted uh, in different parts of the brain so that neurosurgeons could sort of learn where elect the epileptic seizure started and plan, plan the surgery. And then they found these cells that only responded to, to Jennifer Aniston. So that was like a Jennifer Aniston receptive 
field in some sense. Uh, that, that's sort of what the receptive field of that particular neuron. And of course, in Norway, the famous, uh, the our most popular receptive field is the, it's a grid cell receptive field, which sort of codes for, represents where uh, in a room, um, uh, like, a, a, well, in this case, a, a rodent, a rodent is. So that's been, uh, and that's typically, yeah, so that's typically what has been done. That's typically been a way to analyze analyze data, measuring spikes and look for receptive fields, or now maybe even more, you can sort of look for other uh, like statistical measures. And if you measure things, different things at the same time, you can sort of like use different kinds of statistical measures with receptive fields. It's essentially look for the correlation between spiking and some kind of external feature. And then, then uh, so that's like the simplest statistical measure of, of activity. But <coughs> there are many measures of cortical activity. I mean, one thing is the spikes. And as you, if you're really good, you can also impale the cell, even in vivo, and measure the membrane potential. But that's very hard to do. The typical thing what is measured is the extracellular spike, which gives a measure of the, of the firing of action potentials of the, of the neurons with the somas nearby. Then you also have this, you can put in other, another type of electrodes. And what has been popular in the past or in the, well, or past, in the, in the last couple of decades is to put in this multi-electrode. So that's electrodes which are, have many contacts, not only one at the tip as like for this sharp electrode, but many uh, uh, recording points. And then now I think with the, with, with the newest electrodes, I think they're just like they were talking about, uh, well, many hundreds and up to thousands of these contact points uh, at on each shank, which is a, like a fantastic achievement because, of course, all of these these contacts must have individual wires going out here to the amplifiers and recording device. <laughs> but with this, the, the the point is that here you don't get like uh, so sharp spikes typically as you do with these sharp glass electrodes. So here it typically measures spikes from many neurons, or at least a few neurons, and that is called the multi-unit activity. Or, and that's contained in the high frequency part of the signal, maybe about like three, four, five hundred hertz. While the low frequency part, the local field potential, uh, then actually is, is harder to interpret directly because it measures, it measures not spiking directly, it actually measures more reflects the the synaptic inputs and how they are processed in, in, in dendrites. But then you have a bunch of, <laughs> a bunch of um, optical techniques where it's all based on the same thing. You shine, typically shine in light and, and measure what comes out. And then you can put in different kinds of inks and materials uh, so that you can sort of, depending on what you put in and how you put in the light, you get different information. You have two photon calcium imaging is the information about the calcium concentration, intracellular calcium concentration, which is correlated with spiking. And the voltage sensitive dye imaging gives information about um, the, that's ink molecules or, or like reporter molecules that creeps into the membrane of, of these uh, the cells. And, uh, and, and the light that if you shine light on them, or particular uh, the, the right kind of light, then the signal that is returned is proportional to the membrane potential or yeah, membrane pot measures the membrane potential across the membrane. So it gives like a measure of the membrane potential for, of course, not from, a, for an, in practice, not from an individual neuron, but more from a, like dendrites of a collection of, of neurons. And then you also have intrinsic, uh, well, optical imaging, which is then uh, also then, well, that's, that's also measurement technique where you don't put in anything, but you also get, don't get too precise information out. In terms of the electrical and magnetic brain signals, <laughs> uh, which are the ones with most interest here, you have you can put down a, an electrode inside the cortex. Or this is shown on a on a on a like in a, a cross section of a human brain. So this you never do for just research reasons. You always do it for for some clinical reasons, uh, preparing for surgery or something. Uh, but uh, so if you then put in 
uh, put in the electrode, uh, well, put an electrode down here inside the cortex, like here, you can then measure both the LFP and the, and the spikes. Uh, or if you have uh, like electrodes at the cortical surface, it's called the ECOG electrode, then you, you essentially measure activity from the same type of neurons, but it's less focused. I mean, it's the, you're further away from the sources. So each, at least you have many more neurons or, or these columns contributing to the signal. And then you can measure the, uh, measure the potential at the, at the scalp with EEG and also magnetic field, MEG. And so, so that's essentially the, the type of, so when I talk about electrical brain signals, I typically mean how to model like the, or LFP spikes, ECOG and EEG. But it turns out that if you, it's quite, if, if you know, it's not, if you know how to compute the EEG, it's not so different or you don't, yeah, it's not too hard to generalize it to also compute the contribution to the magnetic field that you can measure with MEG. So what do you do with these measures of, of cortical activity? Well, traditional way has, as I said, been to look for correlations between measurements and stimulus and behavior, like you do with a receptive field. But, and then if you were able to measure two things at the same time, or many things at the same time, you typically what's called multimodal measurements, different modalities, different measurement modalities, then you look for correlations maybe between different experiments. So you just still do this statistical thing. And I've seen it's, it's, quite, all, it's, it's quite difficult to actually to, to analyze these things and to make sense of these, this statistical analysis for uh, when you do so like, because it's not really a clear, uh, it's not very clear, clear, typically not very clear results and, and, and conclusions coming out from such studies, at least in my, my opinion. So what we are sort of pursuing is rather what we call physics type multimodal modeling. Because if you, if you have this neuron and which is then embedded in cortex between these layers and you have a, a, a biophysical model of it, then the, the spike or the MUA or the contribution to the multi-unit activity really is, I mean, we say that the spike measures the action potential. And it's true that every time you have an action potential, you see a particular waveform in the spike, in the extracellular potential. But if you want to compute that waveform, you need to know the basic measurement physics. And the basic, basic measurement, measurement physics says that it's actually weighted some of the transmembrane <coughs> currents in the soma region. So it's the transmembrane currents that generates this potential that is, um, well, that is measured by this extracellular electrode. And the LFP or the EEG and MEG actually <coughs> um, correspond, well, I reflect the weight of some of the transmembrane currents all over the neuron. And the voltage sensitive dye imaging, then it's the weight of some of the membrane potentials close to the cortical surface. So we need to work out the mathematical connections between the neuron dynamics and different experimental modalities. But the good thing, if you do that, so what's called the measurement physics, then, then all of these different signals actually corresponds, uh, well, if, uh, then um, can be computed from the same underlying biophysical neural model. So then you don't have to uh, do this just like to just do the statistical correlations, which is, is very much harder to interpret. So that means if you do this physics type multimodal modeling, you're able to actually use all of these recording data at the same time to, uh, to constrain sort of models for, for neurons and networks. So the perspective for model testing is that if you have a candidate model for say network dynamics in the cortical area, <coughs> like just like shown here, it should predict all available measurement modalities, not only spikes, but also these other uh, measurement modalities. Uh, and here we want to focus particularly on these like electric and magnetic measurement modalities. And we also need neuroinformatics tools to make this as simple as possible. So meaning that this is where everybody, well, people interested in information processing uh, 
of how, how, how neural circuits or do information processing, how signal flows in the brain and how, what they mean and what they encode and so on. They put up a model in terms of networks and uh, neural networks of neurons. But then if you have that model, you need to falsify your model uh, by comparing with the things you can measure. So then you have to make the mes measurement physics link, but that is not something that everybody needs to do independently. That's just something you to do, have to do correctly. So you can just use a, like a tool. It can be do once and for all. So <coughs> our group, we have been developing this LFPy tool, which is, it's a, it really stands for local field potential in Python, but it's um, somewhat of a misnomer now because it's not only LFP that you can compute, but also now the new version that uh, came out that we finished a couple of years ago. You can compute I mean, spikes and the MUA and EEG and MEG and ECOG, all kinds of electrical and, and, uh, and magnetic signals. So this is an example uh, of, of what can come out of this type of population. So what this is, is it's a little bit difficult to see, but you see this uh, brush here really correspond to 10,000 biophysically detailed neural models. So it's like, uh, and yeah, so that's like, a, it's like a, what's called a, from the, it's called a Hay model. It's one of these like well-known biophysically detailed layer five pyramidal neural models. And here you just, these dots here represent uh, uh, positions where you measure these uh, extracellular potentials. And <laughs> this is not a recurrently connected network. So all this network does is really to receive synaptic inputs to these cells. And this varies over time. And this that's shown on the left here. In this phase, it receives input all over the place. Here, it receives input at the bottom. And here it receives input at the top. But the, the, the average firing rate is the same at the, I mean, input firing rate is the same uh, 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 always. I think this, yeah. So this sort of tells that the firing of these, these cells. So the point is, even though this, in all cases, this input makes this neuron firing action potentials. <laughs> But because the synaptic inputs are so differently placed, I mean, uh, that you get very, very different uh, extracellular potentials, very different LFPs. Like, for example, if you have all over the place, you don't get a strong LFP at all. If it's at the bottom, then you get a strong negativity. And if it's at the top, you get the opposite, a negativity up here. So this just illustrates that the LFP even though the firing rate, resulting firing, this is some sort of the same the information processing done by this silly network is the same. You get very, very different extracellular potentials. So it's not like a simple rule of thumb that you can just look at the LFP and say, well, this network gets inhibition here or excitation there or whatever. So you have to, in order to analyze it, you have to build mathematical models and, and make predictions. And this is the same thing in terms of uh, where you compute the EEG that would be measured if you had this population at the inside the brain here. Uh, and this is just illustrating populations. And, and on the way to this EEG electrode, it has to pass through this uh, like the skull, which is insulating, a scalp, which is the skin, which is sort of quite conducting, CSF, which is this fluid, which is high conducting. And this is sort of what you would measure uh, with EEG electrodes placed on top of the skull in this, yeah, in this particular spherical head. So we see during one phase, you get the negativity, uh, or is it a positivity? I don't really, it's, it's a positivity, and then you get the negativity and so on. And the same thing, and, and you get a quite different signal if the, if the population, instead of being vertical, is, is uh, horizontal. Then you get a very different, then you get a quite different pattern. And, and here is the same thing we see for um, uh, C4 uh, MEG. So, so this is the like the magnetic field. Uh, and so the point is, this is uh, like a very, very simple network, but, but, this, <coughs> but even for more complicated networks, these forward modeling tools apply. So now if you have a network, you can compute spikes, LFPs, and EEG, and MEG, and, and so on. 
So this is uh, yeah, something which we just uh, finalized and then you can, if you're interested, there is this paper out that came out that's just either easier uh, earlier this year. So now, now we're going to focus uh, on uh, after hopefully motivating why, why this um, mesh modeling of these electrical potentials are important. Uh, I'm going to sort of to, uh, uh, I'm going to sort of talk about uh, like uh, talk about the signals in more detail, and um, or oh, where they come from because this uh, electrical potential is sort of among the oldest and conceptually simplest measurements of neural activity. It's been measured since 1875, uh, and but at that time it was like just because the the, uh, the, the, uh, the equipment the electrical equipment wasn't so good, it was like limited resolution. But the, the principles of all these measurements are the same. So you have this, say in this case, a recording electrode, which measures the potential difference between the tip here and a reference electrode far away. And then you will measure just the signal, which is a potential difference, because electrical potentials are always measured the difference between <coughs> two electrodes. So typically, this reference electrode should be far away so that it's not affected by brain activity so that it's sort of like more like it work as like effectively like a ground electrode. Now, one thing about this potential is that it's, it's like the typical membrane potential is like 60, 70 millivolts, like almost like one tenth of a volt. This is much smaller. This is typically less than a millivolt. So it's a much smaller, uh, smaller signal. Of course, one, uh, one, uh, a millivolt is still a quite big signal given the, uh, given today's amplifiers uh, and so on. But nevertheless, it's, uh, so it's not difficult to measure, but nevertheless, this, that should be kept in mind. And the typical analysis, if you do these extracellular uh, recordings inside the brains, has been to just like to split the signal into two frequency bands. First, the uh, high frequency band, multi-unit activity, uh, which then measures spikes in neurons surrounding electron tip, or the low frequency band, LFP, which measures some threshold activity. Uh, so that's typically been filtered. And, and historically, even though the LFP, local field potential, has been has most of the power of the signal, it was thrown away. Uh, I think, for one, it, because it was much harder to interpret. You couldn't just hear with each spike. You could say, well, that corresponds to an actual potential from a neuron. But the LFP corresponds to some kind of collective behavior, but it's much more difficult to make rules of thumbs and and uh, and explain sort of yeah explain it in terms of uh, just like neurons would like uh, make this this uh, make like a uh, I mean like this, this simple explanations. So also it was this as it contained I mean it also just lack of comp hard disks to store signals made it made it so that many people many record many labs just threw this filtered out the signal and just kept the spikes. So it was often discarded. You know, it was sometimes used in something called CSD analysis. If you had laminar, like electrodes spanning cortical layers or hippocampal layers, but there's been a revival in the, in the last decades. For one, because you have now more and more, well, they have large hard disks, more and more large hard disks, so cheap hard disks, so you can store the signal. Uh, but it's also been realized that it's like unique window into activity in populations. Of neurons, uh, because it's as it's difficult to make to understand what groups of neurons are doing just by measuring spikes. And then it's also it's like a candidate signal for brain computer interfaces uh, because it's more stable than spikes. And we got interested in it because back in the it's like yeah, 15, 20 years ago, where uh, I was collaborating in a lab of uh, Anna de Vore, uh, and also Anders Dale and Istan Ulbert had these really cool electrodes where they had this, Anna did these recordings where she put one, this multi-electrode inside the barrel cortex of, of rodents. And the barrel cortex is this fascinating thing that, that encodes information about like, whisk, you know, like whisking activity or whisking, uh, sensing with whiskers. Like rodents has about 30 whiskers on each side of the snout. And each of them has a particular place in cortex. And if you 
if you put in an electrode, multi-electrode through one of these columns, uh, this, uh, these particular places, and flick the right whisker, you get a strong signal. If you flick the neighboring whisker, then you don't, don't get a very strong signal and maybe not signal at all. But this is what the signal looked like. <laughs> if you had like the stimulus onset here uh, at time zero, and this is like the 22 different recording contacts from the top of the cortex to the bottom of the cortex. So the distance is a tenth of a millimeter between these contacts. Then uh, we got this volume of activity uh, uh, starting about 10, 15 mill milliseconds after you flick the whisker. And if you do the high pass filter, you've got the multi unit activity. Uh, and, and you got a quite different signal. So, so, the, so the, the idea sort of was that, well, okay, we know that this probably, this probably reflects spikes from neurons in the vicinity of these different contacts. Uh, while this measures sort of like the dendritic processing of the synaptic input, it's, it's not so easy to just look at the data and, and come up with the conclusions. So then we started looking at sort of, maybe we can make models for it and compare predictions directly. And then, because one, one really good thing is that the physical origin of LFP, it's in spikes, and for that matter, EEG and MEG also, is the same. It's transmembrane currents. So, um, so the thing is, if we have this, just this very schematic setup, if you have one piece of cortex and say that there's no, that there's only one neuron in this piece of cortex that is active, meaning having transmembrane currents, that's this orange thing. And then if we have <coughs> a sy excitatory synapse uh, uh, injecting current here at this, giving you like synaptic input at this red synapse, there will be actually current going in to the synapse here. And then, uh, sorry, into the neuron here. And if you for now assume that uh, what we call a two compartment neuron, so that all, all, all current, net current that goes in here must leave here. Then from the point of view of the extracellular electrode, then uh, you have a current sink here, current vanishes, and the same current has to leave through, leave out here. That follows from essentially the cable properties of the neuron. So you have a, well, the current source and the same current comes out there. That, oh, sorry, current sink here, <coughs> and the same current comes out here at the, as a current source. So then if you know the distance between the sink and electro tip and the source and electro tip, we can compute the extracellular potential. Oops. So this is what's called the forward solution. So then the total potential is uh, some actually of two, two terms. One term from this, uh, from the sink given here and one curve term from the source. So it's a very simple expression. It's <coughs> the potential is simply given by the current that goes in here divided by the radius in the four pi and this material parameter called sigma, called extracellular connectivity. Uh, so it, and then you have a similar term from the source there, similar contribution from the source. And, and it sort of, a warning here is that it sort of looks like Coulomb's law from those of you who have studied electrostatics that the potential is given by like the charge, the y, the y4 pi, and then the uh, dielectric constant over R. Uh, but that, uh, so that has the same mathematical form, but the physics is different. Here, this is the potential from a current in a conductor. So this is, uh, well, yeah, because this, this neural tissue should be thought of as a conductor, just like a metal, except, except that the uh, connectivity is, is, is smaller. While <coughs> this, this Coulomb's law actually applies for a, in vacuum or in a dielectric. So that's uh, it's just like a very different material. But the point is, this is a very simple, simple uh, model, uh, simple forward, uh, simple formula. And I, uh, one immediate observation is that current monopoles do not exist. Meaning that if you are, uh, since the, the, the current gas rules in here must come out here, uh, it's like the, it, it follows actually that, that, uh, <clears throat> well, in some sense, if, if, um, 
if un, uh, if you only uh, if the if the, or you can think of it if the, if this if this uh, neuron shrinks so that the sinks and source end up at the same place, then you will have a net zero current. So then you have no not an extracellular potential at all. So so the simplest thing, the simplest uh, neural model that sets up a potential is a dipole like the one shown here. The current monopoles do not exist. Current dipoles is sort of like this dominant term typically, but you can also have, uh, uh, you can also have like uh, higher order poles and multipoles and, 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 and so on. So anyway, so from far away, it always looks like a current dipole. And this is what the LFP from a two compartment neuron looks like. So here it's just like plotting this formula. Here, this is a really boring neuron. It doesn't have action potential, active conductances in the soma. So it doesn't produce an action potential. So this is just <coughs> what's called a two compartment model where the current goes in here and it leaves here. This, this orange thing is just to illustrate how it could mimic a neuron. But really it's just a current going in here uh, and, and leaving here uh, or uh, yeah, so that, so, and from that, it follows. Uh, from the, from there, it follows that uh, that uh, that a, a, a current, like if you have a net transmembrane current, like a sink here, you will get the negativity. This is just plotting this formula. In close to this electrode, you get a negative um, negative potential, while uh, far uh, down here you get actually, because that then this term dominates. And close to the soma here, you get the opposite because then this term dominates because then here down here R two is smallest, up here R one is smallest. So so this is the simplest possible LFP pattern. So what this means is that if you measure the potential here, have an electrode here, then you will get this dip, <coughs> and if you measure it here, you will get this peak. So one thing you immediately see is that it's it's like just illustrate here is that it's not very local, meaning that the sy synaptic input up here doesn't only give rise to extracellular potentials around where the synapse is. It also gives uh, gives uh, signals down at the other end. So um, yeah. So so what happens in this simple model is if you have like the synaptic input current shown with dashed lines here going in here. At the same time, you will have a lot of current just leaving at the same at the, uh, in the same compartment. That's this positive thing here because that will be a source. But there will be some <coughs> some current that goes down here, and that's this sort of like this this net current. Uh, so that will uh, so only a small part will actually be a uh, so it'll be a net current going in here and at the same net current going out here, which give gives rise to this. Uh, to this uh, potential distribution. So what are the <coughs> assumptions underlying this formula? Well, uh, this one is that this quasi-static approximations to Maxwell's equations, meaning that the, the frequencies, even though we say high frequencies gives the MUA, it's still only a few hundred Hertz or up to one kilohertz, which is very slow, not very fast, uh, in terms of coupling electric and magnetic fields, for those of you who have studied physics, so you can do this electrostatics and, and magnetic static, magnetostatic approximations. Uh, so if you do this, just take the Maxwell's equation uh, and, and neglect this time derivative of the magnetic field, we get this equation, which means that there's this rotation free, meaning that it's you can actually write this electric field in the extracellular space as a gradient of this potential, the extracellular uh, potential. And, and then the second assumption is that you can describe, and that's maybe the most surprising assumption, that you can describe this, the propagation of signals from like transmembrane currents here to this electrode here, just even though the, the, the current has to meander some, between all these this neurons and so on, it's quite effectively described just by this one material parameter sigma. So this is maybe not obvious why this should be so simple, but this has been tested out experimentally that by 
sending in currents between two electrodes. They can be sort of very well described just by a single parameter. And then <clears throat> there's some other assumptions that they have a linear extracellular medium, meaning that the, the current, if you have impose extracellular field in this medium, you get the current density in this extracellular medium proportional to the electric field. And that is like ohmic, and, and that this is really what it means to be ohmic, homogeneous, frequency independent, and, and isotropic, meaning that it's equally easy to go in all, all directions. And, and if you add actually all of these things together, these, uh, this, uh, this, well, the consequences of this assumption is just that it actually follows from the math that the potential around the point current source is has this simple uh, formula. So uh, I think, uh, and if you then have a source and sink pair, then it um, it sort of it it just get two of well two contributions because the thing is that even though the the neurons themselves of the, the signal processing in neurons is, is very much non-linear and like generation of spikes and so on. The, the, the measurement physics is linear. So the link between going from transmembrane currents to, to extracellular potentials or potentials to MEG, EEG and so on is linear. So that contributions from different transmembrane currents or different neurons just add up linearly. Thank you very much, Carter. Uh... So the, this, uh, you were saying that the medium can be just uh, approximated as a, a homogeneous isotropic uh, conductive. So how, how good is that uh, approximation? Or yeah, so uh, there's like <laughs> several things. So like, um, it turns out that I'm, I'm coming to that tomorrow, uh, but uh, about these approximations, so uh, inside, inside the cortex, inside cortex, the homogeneity assumption is quite good, meaning that it's not very different connectivity in the different layers of cortex. Uh, there's some, but it doesn't really affect the propagation of electrical potentials. There's another question is, um, but, but outside the cortex, if you sort of have like in the, in the, at the interface between cortex and, um, and the white matter, white matter is, is, is fattier, so it has a lower connectivity. So there you get these jumps in extracellular connectivity, which affects the potential that you measure and the propagation of signal, but it typically only affects uh, like electrodes for electrodes or signals recorded very close to the interface. And then you have this anisotropy and that's, that's sort of maybe up to like a 50% effect in cortex. It's, something, it's easier to, to move in the vertical direction uh, along this apical, like this dendrites, like depth direction, than across them. So it's a, the connectivity is a little bit higher. So, but these are things you can sort of actually modify. You can modify the formulas to take that into account. So, so Gelt, one question is if, um, if you want to check the forward models, um, yeah. we have to do real measures in the in vivo environment and with uh, very invasive methods. Oh. And does this actually perturb the? Uh, the other measurements, for example, if we measure membrane potential, does this perturb the LFP that is measured around it? And is there a way to check the forward model without perturbing uh, uh, I'm not quite sure if I understood the question. So you're saying that if you... If you so if, if, I want, to, if I want to check the forward model, so I put yeah. the membrane potential uh, device measure, measurement device and the uh, normal electrode to measure LFP, Mm. And does this per, the, does the fact of doing this perturb of the measure of the LFP? And so yeah, so, okay. So I think it's actually it's um, I think this this kind of measurements was done. It's it's hard to do, but it has been done by uh, well, it was done in in uh, in Judy Bushaki's lab for the hippocampal neuron, where they had like they measured the membrane potential, and the, and uh, with the like intercell electrode. And, and the extracellular spike at the same time. So I think, I mean, it's, it's true that there's obviously this, when you have electrodes in there, uh, it sort of can, it, it sort of disturbs the situation. I'm not quite sure how strong, strong the effects are though. I mean, I think it's, uh, 
uh, it's uh, well, it certainly perturbs it, but I don't think it it ruins the validation by itself. At least if you, I think it's a uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's uh, <laughs> also in particular the LFP. If it, it's also a question whether you validate the spikes versus the LFP. LFP typically varies less with space, it because it's more low frequency. So that's probably less perturbed uh, by less affected by perturbations. Uh, but I think that uh, if you talk about validation of this whole scheme, I think it's it's like a, they're like separate lines of, of, of validation. And I think one line of validation is sort of is actually the one starting point is the cable equation. Does the cable equation or this biophysically detailed models like Hodgkin Huxley style, is it accurate in the sense that it predicts the right transmembrane currents? Uh, so that's like one. And of course, I don't. I think it. I think it's difficult. At least I cannot understand how how you could sort of get the successes of Hodgkin and Huxley if you were completely off with the transmembrane currents, because the transmembrane currents really are they are at the heart also of that model. And then the second question: Well, given that you have the transmembrane currents, uh, how uh, uh, do we know that it computes the right extracellular potential? And that can be done separately if you by injecting, if you're having small and small electrodes and injecting currents and measure the potential that's set up like just by extracellular current sources. And, and that has been validated quite, uh, quite accurately, at least on a bit longer down to like 100 micrometer length scales. I'm quite sure if that was an answer to your question, but uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. So also, I wondered with the forward like approach, maybe when you simulated some cells and then you try to look at those signals, how it would look at the LFP and so on. This is only being done when they're not connected to some that mm -hmm. So what would happen if you started to connect them and make a recurrent network and also try to forward model mm -hmm. But I don't think so. So 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 the the thing that it's recurrently connected doesn't change the forward modeling thing. So because the the if. Uh, when you drive it, I mean, in in the example I showed with this bush of neurons, then all synapses came from the outside. Uh, so, of course, if you have, rec uh, and so the network activity, the spiking activity is quite simplified and uniform and boring. Uh, so if you hook them up recurrently, then the spiking dynamics gets much more interesting, of course, and it's much harder to, to predict what kind of spiking dynamics you have. But the link between the spiking dynamics or the link between the transmembrane currents and what you measure is the same. So it's like, it's like the, the dynamics that makes a complicated... Uh, so, 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 so the measurement physics is not affected by a more complicated recurrent network. Yeah. I just wondered how, for example, how does the LFP signal look in that case? Is it with a yeah. radio? It was really difficult to decipher what was the original spike. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah. yeah, no, so, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, so it really depends on... We have done some... Uh, dance, I mean, it, it, it really depends on the network activity. We've done some... I mean, like maybe I could show that tomorrow. Uh, just some examples. We just uh, computed the LFPs. Uh, from this uh, Brunel network model in different regimes, where you have this a, a asynchronous irregular state and uh, and like the synchronous the different kind of network dynamic network like brain states essentially, and you get very different LFPs, and just like as you get very different spiking patterns, you get also get very different LFPs. But then an additional complication when you compute LFPs that it's it's not only the spiking dynamics that determines LFP, but it's also where on the neuron the synapses are placed because that doesn't really matter uh, when it comes to well you can think of it at least if you have multi-compartmental neurons if you move the synapse but say scale the synaptic weight so that like the same amount of current goes into the soma the, sp the dy spiking dynamics would not be much changed but that could completely change lfp and uh, and uh, because it's um, yeah so, so, but I, I think in general, what you have to do, like I always say, is that, I mean, I don't. Our group over the last ten years have done a lot of like computing LFPs and spikes and so on for different setups. 
and and often our intuition is 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 wrong <laughs> i must say uh, about when you what you don't get what you expect maybe uh, but the, the good thing is that you can always compute it the, the the forward modeling scheme i would say is is much more reliable than our intuition you see what i'm saying so i think the forward modeling scheme is quite uh, quite reliable I, I i sort of think that is built it's quite on quite solid footing Hey, uh, thank you, Gauta. I think there are no more questions for now, so uh, we, sure. we can continue tomorrow at 2, then? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you then. Thank you very much. Perfect. Okay. Hold on.